Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, the first podcast to bring you the local fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. Bush, do you feel that? Spring? No, I can't quite put my finger on it. I just feel like something's been missing in this show for a couple of weeks. I don't know. Mm. I, I don't think I'm, so, man. Yeah, I'm bringing sexy back. That's oh, okay. That's, what that's it interesting. Is. It's well, it is, good to ha- it is good to have you back on, <laughs> regardless of whether or not the sexy is back or not. Right. I don't know. I, good to uh, have you back, man. Yeah, it's been, it's, I miss talking to you guys. I, yeah, uh, had some good shows. Yeah, it has been. Downloads have been through the roof. Everybody's got their minds switched back to fishing, switched off of turkey hunting or whatever other thing that they like to do. Uh, it's, uh, it's heating up, man. There's a lot yeah. going on. I, I was, I actually went to the freshwater side of things last week and, Went down and visited my brother down in South Florida, and we got on some big bluegills. I forgot how much fun that is. It's a lot of fun. I had a it's a lot less work time. than saltwater fishing. It's really simple. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good thing about it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. But uh, yeah. got a lot happening this week. Got, got some new regulation changes in place. Pretty yep. interesting to see how quickly that came about. I mean, you guys just talked to Scott Bannon on episode 55. Uh, yeah, he goes into depth. He goes into depth pretty good about how uh, the speckled trout changes and the flounder flounder changes are going to you know impact our fishery around this area. Yeah, I enjoyed listening to that show. Scott's a guy that I mean, I've talked to him personally. I mean, he genuinely cares about the fishery and he genuinely cares about the fishermen. I think so you know, as well. A lot of times you see just I don't know. Government gets a lot of flack and a lot of it deservedly so uh, in a lot of places. But those guys at the Marine Resources Division, they, they really do, in my opinion, a great job. They really do care about our fishery and, and what's going on. And I wasn't there for everything, but it definitely seems like public opinion swayed this a lot. A lot of people really wanted those limits to, to be changed. And so it looks like they really, along with science and data, it looks like they really uh, did what the people were asking for. I think so. I think it's going to impact the fishery a lot. Really, technically, I'm pretty new to inshore fishing, speckled trout and whatnot. We never, never did it growing up. I was always a deep sea guy. Uh, Lady Anne could not get in very skinny water to catch right. those trout. So right. I'm not sure as far as, you know, overfishing and all that, but uh, more little fish got to equal more bigger fish. So, well, you know, I like to say, I'm not privy to the data and I wasn't at every meeting where the public did voice their opinion, but I mean, to get them to come on this show and, and offer to say, hey, here's my email address, here's my phone number, yeah. call me, let me know what you're thinking. There was plenty of opportunity to, to put your say in. And it sounds like, and, and just anecdotally from talking to people, we talked to a lot of people For uh, sure. online, on social media. It, it really does seem like this is what people wanted. So it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to see how it works out. Uh, it, I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I definitely don't think it's going to hurt anything. It's got to, like I said, it's just got to help from here. Yeah. Excited to see what happens. Well, uh, you know, one of the guys that's been fishing the waters around here for a long time and knows, I don't know, I just really like talking to David Thornton, the peer pounder. He's always got a little different spin on things. He sees some things that, that you and I would never see when we're out there. Let's go on down and talk to David and see what's going on at the Gulf State Park Pier. David, how's it going? Well, it's like spring is in full swing now, Joe. We got the first king of the, of the season was caught this past weekend. A buddy of mine from Fairhope caught a 25-pounder on a artificial lure. And uh, really, he was just fishing for larger Spanish. And uh, that nice king grabbed it. Yeah, that's a and nice one. It is. It is. And, and often that happens early in the season. A lot of the kings that come in, or, or the bigger ones, it's like they're feeding on the small Spanish mackerel because there's not a lot of bait around the pier as of yet. A few squid and some large glass minnows, but not the big schools of LYs like we typically think of late in the spring and on into the summer. So that's that's coming in a few weeks, but the water temperature's still a little on the cool side, you know, middle to upper 60s. When it tips up above 70, that's really when the it seems like the bait starts moving inshore, probably by the full moon, you know, later in April, uh, towards the end of the month around Easter or so, we'll start seeing some bait schools moving into the beaches pretty quick and, and more game fish will follow them in when that happens. Let me ask you a question about that water temperature. When you've got a day or days where the water temperature is not quite, you know, where you're talking about, let's say it's not quite at that 70 degree mark, 
do you find that fishing more towards the middle of the day can improve things? I mean, will the water temperature heat up enough with the sun coming up to, to move some bait in that, that won't be there at, at maybe first light and last light? Or is it really more of just a water temp needs to be a stable uh, 70 degrees? Yeah, it's, you know, it's pretty dynamic. It does the first, the top few feet of the water column does, uh, you know, pick up a little bit of of heat during the day. And it uh, can vary a few degrees at least, especially if the water, you know, is a deeper green and the sun is shining pretty strong and the wind's not blowing too hard. Uh, that, that water can absorb a lot of, of energy. Um, not necessarily light, but, but the energy, you know, heats the water up and then it slowly releases it during the night, you know, so it's kind of a wash. And what we look for is like a day to day rise in these water temperature graphs to where it's like a stair step and you'll see it, you know, kind of go up during the day and then it may fall a little bit at night and it goes up a little more the next day and, and it, you know, falls again the next night especially when we get these cool fronts through this time of year, that north wind knocks the waves down and uh, makes the surface near the shore pretty flat. But it gives the sun an opportunity to really penetrate deep into that water and maybe warm the water column a little more thoroughly than it does on a day, you know, perhaps where just the sun is out during the middle of the day for an hour or two. You know, you're not going to have as much heating under a situation like that. So do you think there's any value in picking and choosing your times? I, I'm one of those guys, and we've talked on here before, about not being a spot fisherman, you know, and I, that's something I have to, it's a hard, bad habit that I have to try to break is, you know, not just going and fishing a spot because that's where I caught them last time. And I'm also the same way with timing, you know, like I personally, I just want to be out there at first light. I feel like if I'm not there at first light that I've missed something. Is there anything... Yeah on the pier specifically or in the surf, is there anything to, you know, sleeping in every once in a while if the conditions are right? Yeah. Sometimes it can be really make a big difference. I, I watch the tides, uh, especially in the winter time, you know, the high tide that, that, that rather the low tide is early in the morning and then the tides coming in all day. And, and sometimes during the cooler months, the best time to fish may be the last two or three hours of the day when the tide's <laughs> getting higher and it's pulling warmer water in from the deeper Gulf. And, you know, and now this time of year, sometimes the mornings start pretty good it, uh, because the water is starting to kind of turn over. If you'd put it in a freshwater sense where in a, in a pond or a lake where it's fairly shallow, the water starts to kind of, instead of the warmer water being on the bottom, it starts to rise to the top like you would expect. And as days get warmer, we'll see more and more of that. And, and also the tides are starting to progress through the springtime into more of the summer mode where we have the high tides move on into the afternoon instead of, you know, late at night. So uh, during the daylight hours, you may actually see the highest point of the tide. And any time around those, you know, the change in the tide cycle or if the wind you know, picks up with a sea breeze or something like that, it may trigger a bite. Often, the you know, of course, a lot of times morning, especially for pelagic fish, it seems like they, they really key off in the morning and they, uh, they break out of their holding schools that they're in during the night and then they start running around looking for something to eat and they may run inshore real quick. And then they may, when the sun gets bright, they may move offshore later in the day. And so it depends on the water temperature and the clarity, uh, how much sun there is in the sky, you know, because they don't have eyelids or, you know, a hat and sunglasses like we do. So they, their only protection for their eyes is to go deeper into the water column to filter that light a little more. So it's not as strong and they're not blinded. I just feel like you're down there with them sometimes, David. Just how do you know all this stuff, man? He lives with them, I think. <laughs> Beast Bone was saying last week that he did a lot of sleeping in. Uh, he said the afternoon was on fire and the morning was literally non-existent. Yeah, we had a period where that low tide in the morning, I, I think because the surf temperature was little, uh, kind of lingering a few degrees behind the what the ambient temperature was out further out in the Gulf. Mm -hmm. And when the high tide started pulling some of that warmer water in, 
plus you've had you know four to six hours of sun warming that shallow water you know it, there may be a brief period during the afternoon and in the early evening when when that shallow water is a little warmer and those cold-blooded fish that's all they need to trigger them into a you know a little bit of a feeding frenzy relatively speaking but the fish would go on the feed and more inclined in the afternoon and in the morning when it's chillier it was right after the moon was full last week too yeah david you mentioned that 70 degree temperature mark for kings and when i was doing a lot of cobia fishing 67 was what i was always looking for seemed like to be the magic number that where we started to see a numbers of fish show up what about Pompano? Do you have a do you have a magic number on them, and and what's been going on on the pier for Pompano? Pompano been pretty steady, you know, the last month or so on the pier. As far as uh, I should say, consistent. They haven't been steady yet, though. There have been some good days where they you know catch thirty, forty Pompano off the pier, but a lot of undersized, just like what we've been seeing on the beach, but some really good ones mixed in as well. And uh, again, they they do tend to kind of move around more and feed more uh, sometimes on that, that incoming tide, uh, especially if the sea breeze kicks up and it starts stirring a little bit of waves breaking on the bar that may, you know, dislodge some food items for them. And it, it, it'll stimulate them, you know, again, because there's, there's food nearby and it, it just gets them more in the, in the mood to eat. Probably the temperature where it t- really tips off is, is about like cobia. Their temperature gradient, seem, their temperature preference is probably pretty close to that, like in the mid to upper 60s. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, to hang a number on it, I'd say 65 to 68, you know, somewhere in that range, mm-hmm. uh, about like what you said. And by the time, like about the full moon in April, they start moving offshore to actually spawn. But they, they tend to stay in that surf zone. It's like they, you know, they're, they'll be using the moon, especially in clear water, as far as like for schooling and, and sometimes for feeding as well. And I've, I've even heard about people catching them from the beach at night under a full moon. That'd be fun. So, yeah, because yeah. you know how light it is, you know, on a, on a clear night when the sky's clear and, and the winds are light and, and you've got a full moon. It's it's like 6.30 in the morning, you know, before the sun, just before the sun comes up. You've got plenty of light. You can almost, you know, you could tie a knot if you wanted to, probably in that much light. I'll tell you this. Not a guy like me, but maybe some younger guys could. But not I'll, t- really. I'll tell you this much, you know, like, like Angelo likes to say, my, my pro tip of the week was, is, <laughs> well, one night we decided we were going to go out and catch sand fleas. We were going to fish the next morning. And I couldn't believe how much easier it was to catch those sand fleas at night. And yeah. I mean, we, it, we weren't, we couldn't see the colonies like you can in the day. We were just literally uh-huh. going to the water's edge and raking at the water's edge. And we caught just all, all we needed. I mean, it was a little bit later in the year, but it was still April. And I, yeah. I think just th- being at night, those, those, they were up in the sand. And I think, you know, like if you've ever tried to walk up on a colony of sand fleas, they, they can either hear or see you coming and they come and they will go down. So yeah. that's just another thing that I wonder if that has anything to do with that, that full moon bite, but that's, uh, that's interesting, David. Well, it sounds like things are, are starting to improve down there on the pier. And, uh, thanks for that report, man. I, I know we're going to get a cool tip from you this week. Uh, but before we do, we got to give the onshore, uh, sponsor and that, that is killer doc, man. These guys, butch, are are selling the fire out of some killer docks right now they uh they are i need to get well, one if you don't have one i went and saw them over at the wharf on saturday and they had an awesome setup over there i believe they sold out over there didn't they they did they had a really good had a really good weekend over there it's awesome people are loving them that's cool you know uh, we do we put a lot of time and money and energy into our fishing and uh most of us don't have a fish cleaning station that we're proud of and Butch, I mean, I know you, you've you suffered from dock dysfunction. I think we all have at some point. For sure. I actually just, just texted Jay a minute ago. I said, I'm around all week and this weekend. Let's get mine put up. So hopefully we can get mine put up. <laughs> yeah, you need to get that thing fixed, man. I'm ready. No, no need in dealing with rotten wood or rusty metal. And like we said a couple of weeks ago, cleaning those sheep's head literally not a scale on the dock i couldn't i couldn't believe that you just think about when you're cleaning fish and you just end up with a belly full of on your shirt you got slime Mm -hmm. and blood and scales nothing 
none of that stuff anymore. So y'all check out Killer Dock. They combine durability, function, and design to uniquely upgrade your entire dock experience. Y'all check them out at killerdock.com. David, what you thinking about for an onshore tip this week? Well, with the water temperature still being a little on the coolish side, the you know the bait fish haven't shown up very strongly along uh, at the pier, and a lot of people are still using cigar minnows, and you know inshore guys are using frozen shrimp a lot of times. And, and one thing I'm thinking about is that I you know I, I have an hour drive from Mobile, and I'll take advantage of that time, and I'll I'll let my cigar minnows or my bait shrimp you know, just sit in a bucket in the back of the car on the ride over there so they can begin to thaw out. I don't want to keep them in my cooler, you know, and and then when I get there, I've got, you know, rock hard, solid frozen bait to deal with. So what I'll do a lot of times is is let it thaw a little bit and especially the shrimp that I uh that I'll freeze in seawater. You know, that salty water when it starts to thaw out, it doesn't just dissolve like an ice cube it, it gets kind of flaky and soft and you can so you can break two or three of those shrimp out around the edges and just keep doing that way and and you don't have to waste valuable fishing time you know trying to sit in there with under the sink at the pier or on the beach dunking your bait you know getting your feet wet before the sun comes up even and and trying to thaw your bait out it's already partially thawed and you can get started as soon as you get there well, so David, I, you talked about uh you talked about snobbling uh, i was actually just looking that was that was our april 30 to may 6 2018 episode okay All right. what, ep- what episode number was that butch episode, episode nine. nine you talked a l- about snobbling in that episode so y'all go back and listen to what david said there but uh david essentially you were targeting king mackerel when you're doing that why would you not want to just, what, what's the problem with just throwing out a frozen cigar minna? Well, sometimes that mackerel, when he picks that frozen cigar minna up, it, it just doesn't have the right consistency. You know, it would be more like a block of wood or, or biting an ice cube. You know, if you've ever tried to bite an ice cube, it's pretty hard. And that, in fact, a lot of pier guys call those frozen cigar minnas popsicles. And if you, you know, if that king picks up a popsicle and bites into it and he's expecting a nice, you know, warm, mushy cigar minnow and it, it's, he may spit, you know, and you pull your, your minnow in and it's got teeth marks all over it, but, but no bite, you know. Snobble sickle. That's it. They probably can, I, you know, I don't know if they taste or anything like that in the conventional sense that we do, but they can, when they bite down, they certainly can feel the consistency of the bait. And and if it's frozen, it's going to have a much different consistency than what they're expecting. And it may spook them and they might spit it out. Yeah, you know, know that's we, not right. I mean, they don't eat frozen fish in the Gulf, obviously. They know it's not it, right. No. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not sure if the, you know, if the coldness affects their mouth or anything like that. Well, like just the hard, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's certainly not the consistency that they're used to when they bite in on a on a piece of fish and they they may think it's not something edible and spit it out. That's it's a great a, tip and, this week, David. Thanks for that. I think a lot of folks just overlook a lot of the little things. Uh I know I'm one of them and you you get frustrated enough by something, <laughs> you know, ten times of doing it that way and you think, I'm gonna take my cigar minutes out when I'm heading home when I'm heading well, from the house. I mean a, a snobble sickle if you lose three nice kings that could be your day yeah your whole day. Day. whenever you're whenever you're you know cigar minutes are too frozen that could be your whole day right there yeah and often you know and, and like getting back to the water temperature thing especially with the pelagic fish we're getting more and more into that time of year where that morning bite is pretty critical they had a day earlier this week on the state pier where the spanish bite was over with by about 7:30 pretty for the most part at least the uh the flurry of it was and a lot of people had their limit in that hour and a half you know from mm. first light until then and it was like the people that arrived afterwards were just pick up one here and one there they really had to work a lot harder at at getting that bite and you know it's it's when the kings show up it'll probably be about the same way uh, you know, there may be some of that afternoon bite that's triggered on the wind and the tide, but 
a lot of it is going to be, you know, first light kind of thing. And the more we get into the summer, the more we'll see that. David, I know you've been bestowed the honor of being the president of the ACFA this year. And I guess two years, right? You'll be this year and next year. What's going on? Y'all got a tournament coming up, right? On April 6th? Right. That'll be our second tournament of the year. And we have eight throughout the year. It's a really fun organization. We don't fish for money. It's strictly plaques and bragging rights and and just trying to help spread the word with inshore fishing and, and talk up things inshore fishing. And we have also, besides the weekend turn the Saturday tournaments, we also have a year round big fish contest where we track the ten largest fish for ten different species, inshore species. And at the end of the year we'll we'll crown uh, you know, the champion for that and we'll also crown the tournament champions. And one thing we're doing this year too is that we've uh inaugurated the junior anglers the people, the kids under 16, boys and girls both, have their own division, and they uh, accumulate points and plaques on their own, separate from the adults. So we'll, at the end of the year, we'll have a separate uh, adult master angler, and then we'll have a separate uh, junior master angler as well. And so it's a great opportunity for the kids to get introduced to inshore fishing, learn a lot, talk to people. Uh, you know, we have some Really good uh, speakers, Bobby Averscotto. Some peer pounder guy talks there every once in a while. Yeah, you know, that, that guy will talk about fishing anytime. But uh, Patrick uh, Garmison also, and, you know, we we have a lot of other guys that, that come and, and talk, some of the, you know, guides that everybody's familiar with and, and or you know, even on the podcast. And we can, they'll, they'll get a chance to interact with them, you know, yeah. where I'm going. Yeah, it's a and lot that, of fun, and you'll get y'all. Y'all have meetings first first Thursday of every month. If folks want to get more information online or or become a member, what's the best way for them to reach out? Go to acfafishing dot com. That the website has pretty much everything that you need to know about the club. About joining, you can join online. Even the dues are only fifty dollars a year, and that includes uh, being eligible for all these tournaments that I mentioned. Plus, we have store prizes and drawings at all the meetings. And then we, at the end of the year in December, we have our awards banquet and that is part of your uh, dues. That's included in your dues for you and your family. Yeah. And that, you know, the husband, wife, and, and the, any kids under 16. And this year we expanded that to also include grandkids as well. Nice. I well, didn't know great. about the big fish at the end of the year thing. Yeah. It's, it's a fun banquet and uh, gets everybody together. We uh, take time to celebrate the champions in each division and and also, you know, call out the big fish contest winners. Well, you, you said I get crowned. I look great in a tiara, so I'm going to hold you to that whenever I win this year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll have your Sir, name and put on there, Butch. <laughs> Sir Butch. Sir Butch of the Sail Cat. Crowned there you go. All right, David, we'll check in with you soon, buddy. Hope you get back out there and uh, have some good luck. Thanks for the report. Okay, anytime. Good luck, y'all. All All right, Joe. It's always great to hear from the old pier pounder. Let's head on down to the Mobile Bay, Mississippi Sound Causeway Report. Let's see what Captain Richard Rutland's doing. Old cold-blooded fishing. What you say, Captain Richard? What's up, fellas? Man, Man, enjoying this pretty weather, huh? Woo, I can't get enough, man. It's just tickling me to death that there's been a bunch of sunshine and uh, not a ton of rain, which looks like we're going to get a little bit of rain tomorrow, but uh, it's definitely making things interesting. Uh, you can get out and get around and get some things done, you know what I mean? Uh, sure. it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've been all over the place here uh, recently. Fish everywhere? Or? They are. Uh, I was uh, just telling one of my customers, he asked me where we were going to meet, and I said, man, you know, yesterday I fished out of Dog River, today I fished out of Dolphin Island, and tomorrow I'm going to the Causeway, you know. So if that doesn't tell you something right there, I don't know yeah. what will. Because, uh, you know, there, there's there's things there's things happening everywhere. Had an incredible bull red fishing trip down to the island today. Well, yeah. let me guess where. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> Where'd you... Uh, ding, 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 ding. You yeah, got what's it. the pattern? We've been down there in uh, Dixie Bar right there off Fort Morgan Point. 
Really, the past couple of times, I've, I've, I've only gotten on these. The fish have been there for a couple of weeks. But uh, every time I've gone out there and uh, caught them, uh, you can see them. You know, you can see the school. It's not uh, it's not one of those things where you have to set up this big monster drift and fan cast or pull live baits or anything. I just kind of ease on down the bar and start to look for, uh, for fishy activity, you know, uh, birds working areas or, or you'll see some big slicks pop up and whatnot. And, uh, sure enough, you know, and one day, one day I found a big mud, you know, like where there's like a great big muddy area or whatever. And sure enough, I slowed down and started looking and poof, there was a school, you know, there was just, you can see the water almost turns orange, you know, like that kind of copper color. Mm-hmm. Uh, where you can actually see the fish, so it's all sight casting, which is awesome. That's and I've uh, been been targeted them with uh, with grubs today. We use nothing but uh, Joey Landry knows little slick lure, the little, the smaller one on a uh, on a three eight ounce jig head, and you just kind of get get near the school and uh, cast your jig head in there, man. And most of the time, as soon as it hits the water, you, you have to be flipping the bail ever pretty quick. Man, get that's the reeling fun. gear because you'll have a fish pretty much immediately you know so it's really really hot action any particular color are they just eating everything man uh, I, when they get out there like that i don't really pay attention to color i really think i could thread a piece of beef jerky on there For and sure. throw it out there and they'd probably crush it you know so uh actually when i'm going through my slicks you know my uh my little slicks i kind of pick the colors that i don't use a whole whole lot uh that i have a whole, whole lot of confidence in yeah. uh you know I'll, i kind of throw like i've been throwing like a motor oil looking color one all day today at them and they were eating it but they also ate a pink one and a, a chartreuse one and then one that i guess kind of like a, a cajun pepper uh color that's clear with uh red and black flake in it so um like i said man i i don't think color is Just very uh, necessary <laughs> Yeah, uh, one thing I do do is put a little scent on there. I use a Procure uh, <laughs> indoor said, formula, and I'll put a little bit of Procure on there um, to kind of add a little scent to it, and I think that helps. But anywho, it's red hot. For the folks that, that uh, aren't maybe fami- that familiar with Dixie Bar, you know, I've been surprised at how many people are listening from out of town and will message us and say, you know, they just, they're trying to keep tabs on things because they're going to come down for a week or two or three during the year. And uh, explain a little bit about Dixie Bar. Maybe just maybe just tell us kind of how that bar actually orients to Fort Morgan and and what to look for. Because I think that's a, a lot of people expect to go out there and see like a, a literal sandbar, you know, like above the waterline. And right. there, they don't know exactly, well, are we on the bar? Are we off the bar? So, you know, when you're on the bar, what kind of depths are you looking for? And then when you're off the bar, what kind of depths are you looking for? And then maybe talk a little bit about how you set up on your, on your drift for those fish or, or what you do, depending on what you're seeing. Okay. So just to kind of give everybody a lay of the land, Dixie Bar starts pretty much at the point of Fort Morgan and it runs parallel on the east side of the ship channel it runs parallel to the ship channel and it goes all the way out past the lighthouse it's a very very long bar that that's at least three miles worth of water right there that i that i know of that's fishable out there as you get on down to maybe the last two-thirds of the bar real close to the ship channel it's like three or four feet deep it's an actual sandbar out there um and there's several bars that kind of, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, systems of bars and troughs that go uh, back to the east. And that's usually what I'm trying to drift over is kind of get up on top of the bar and I'll start there. And then you'll kind of drift into a trough where it comes down from three or four feet and it goes down to nine or ten feet, something like that. And then it comes right back up to five or six and then it drops off again. And sometimes the fish are laying in the troughs. Sometimes they're up on top of the bar. This go round, the fish have been all the way on the east side of the bar. And like I said, we're seeing them. You know, you just kind of idle on down the outside of the of the uh, most eastern sandbar, and you'll 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 see. Like I said, it looks like a big copper. Co- the water almost looks copper, or it'll look like a cloud or something is there. And that's the fish. Typically, when we don't have this, the, the water's emerald, I mean, just crystal clear down there. You, you got 10, 10, 12 foot of visibility in the water out there today. Uh, but typically, I'll start up shallow and I just let the boat drift, you know, whichever way the, uh, and, and I'm not real picky about the tide, which 
you know, whether it's an incoming or an outgoing tide. I just like a uh, water movement period. And I'll just make a long drift, you know, sometimes like two or three hundred yard long drift. If I don't get a uh, don't get a bite, I'll kind of look at my track on my GPS and I'll shuffle down about two or three hundred yards and I'll make another drift and shuffle down and, and keep on doing that till you set up till you, till you start to find some success. And then you start trying to make the same drift over and over again. Man, that's that's a great that's a great advice. You just kind of make your lines there and cover all that ground. I like that a lot. Yeah, and then something um something else Joe was uh, uh to add to his uh, question there as far as finding fish, I just look for light. Birds. You look for little turn. Yep, little turns and birds stuff like that working, and uh, and then of course uh, when they're feeding out there real heavily, they'll 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 create fish slicks, which we're going to talk about in a little while. So I look for big slicks, look for bait activity look for birds working and just kind of get in that general area and start and start working, you know, start, start making some long drifts. For sure. Well, if you hadn't been out there on the bar and, and given that a shot, it, it, this is, this is the time of year when it's just, I mean, it can always, always be fine. good, but Richard in this, I mean, it can just get ridiculous out there. Dude, it's as, right now it's as good as I've ever seen it. I probably saw about, six or eight different schools of a thousand plus fish today out there. I mean, I, I literally, I think, I think there's gotta be 10,000 fish, 10,000 bull reds out there on that bar right now. I mean, it is incredible. And, uh, something, something that always triggers my mind to go out there and think about that is whenever the wharf boat show happens, that yeah. always seems to be something that I correlate those two things with. When the wharf boat shows happen, the redfish are usually out there on Dixie bar. It's usually right around, you know, sometime in March or um, or the first part of April, like we're in right now. That sounds fun. Um, Those things are fun to fight on light tackle. They sure are. So, like I said, I usually just uh, I usually grub it. I used to drag, you know, uh, live croakers and drift and do all that kind of stuff. And I've gotten to where I've got a lot of confidence uh, bouncing a grub along, especially something with some scent on there. You know, I like using gulps. And then, like I said today, we're using the little slick. And uh, and add a little bit of procure to it, but they're such scent oriented feeding fish that I think having some type of scent is very important. I imagine that'd be a really good application for the um, fish bites. They make that uh, that Fight Club version big time, and that, that stuff works too, as good as Gulp does. I really like that fish bites. Well, what about the trout situation? So, uh, trout situation is really starting to come together. You can tell that we're still a little bit in a transition period because on some of these warmer days when you get up on the flats you'll just really 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 do well and we'll have a little cool off like what we're kind of coming off of right now you'll have a little cool off and it kind of slows them down checks them up a little bit and so you'll go there one you'll go to a spot one day and absolutely just wreck them and then come back you know a couple days later after a cool off period and it'll be somewhat slower and the fish aren't as grouped up quite as good as they were. And you just, uh, you just have to have to work a little harder. Um, we got on a great bite South of the mobile river the other day, in the upper part of the bay. It was one of those things where we were making, we we're just making a real long drift. I'm talking about, I was making a four or 500 yard long drift. And every time you catch a fish with power pole down and, we catch you maybe get one one more bite or two more bites or something like that and as soon as we pick up and start drifting again we start catching fish and so what that told me is that they were scattered so i just kept on drifting the whole time i quit anchoring down on them but uh it's that way up there and then the other places i've done well in trout is down mississippi sound down there in grand bay and portersville bay have been uh have been very active and uh seeing some of kind of the exact same pattern as far as the uh in correlation with the weather heating up and cooling off i've got a question for you about these these fish when they're up on the flats like that and you mentioned them being scattered bobby has talked in past shows about fish orienting to structure or fish orienting to bait we're moving we've got this transition happening right now where these fish are, are moving out of the rivers they're moving up onto the flats. When they get up on these flats like that, what are they orienting to? Are they orienting to small changes in depth? Are they just scattered at all times? What do you, what can somebody look for if they wanted to key in on something? You know, this time of year, I really like to try to find oyster shells, some type of shell or grass. You know, that, those two things right there are going to hold bait 
small shrimp and minnows and mullet and stuff like that. And I think that that's what they're orienting to is our places that have one of those two components. And something I tell folks all the time, you know, the, the, the old hotspots map that you can go by at West Marine or Academy or something like that and uh, gives you layout of Mobile Bay. And it shows you where a lot of that stuff is, you know, it'll say, okay, grass flats or uh, oyster shell or sandy bottom or whatever it is. But those two things, the grass and the oyster shells right now, are the two things that I'm really fishing over. So I think that in correlation with the water depth, you know, the shallower water depth this time of year tends to, tends to be a little bit hotter than, than deeper water stuff. That's great, man. That's some really good stuff. You are the... Can answer the hey cap question this week. We have an old friend of ours. Vic called me all fired up about this last week. He said, I'm gonna send you a hey cap question. I said, All right, Vic, that sounds great. So Vic Johnson asks, and Vic Johnson is gonna be the recipient of that Fair Hope rattle this week. Thanks for your question, Vic. Vic emailed us at Alabama at bestfishingreport.com to get his question in. When riding around looking for slicks, how can you tell the difference in an actual trout slick? and what I call a phantom slick. And can you explain fishing trout slick technique? So to answer that question, uh, I tell you what's funny about slicks is most of the time you find slicks when you're in transit, you know, when you're running from one plate, from point A to point B, you know, from one fishing spot to another. Right. And most of the time I smell the slick before I even see it. It, they they kind of have a uh, everybody says they smell like watermelon and once you smell one you you get a nose for it. I, I always kind of joke around with people whenever I smell that smell I kind of get aroused. You know I always say <laughs> I wish they could put that stuff in a can so I could just walk around my house spraying it everywhere. You know you know it's about uh, to be on. But, uh, no hold on a minute hold on a minute now I'm gonna call complete I'm calling complete BS on this. I, I just this is. Uh, this is this is like I can so totally see Richard out on the boat. He's like, y'all smell that slick? Like he saw the slick like <laughs> ten minutes ago, but he's just trying to you know really ha- have some showmanship for his client. Y'all, y'all smell that slick? <laughs> man, I'm right telling here. you, man, I'm, I'm like, a, I'm like. Uh, <laughs> and then they catch a fish, and you're like, I need that. Let me get that tip, guys. Don't forget about mm-hmm. that tip. <laughs> uh huh. I, I, I'm like a I'm like a bird dog smelling a bird in the field, man. Whenever I uh, whenever I smell you, one of those slicks, you, I stop. You I point stop at him, point, you know, point. I do. I do. <laughs> He's up up on the but, bottom, uh, short shorts yeah. on, smelling them. So something that Vic asked was about a phantom slick. Okay, so we have thing. You know, we have we have slicks all the time, and what I call them wind slicks. You know, and most of the time, you'll have like a a, a bank or something like that, or a point. And you'll see this great big long, uh, you know, sometimes it looks like it's a mile long looking slick and it's real thin and slender and long. And that's a wind slick and you want to ignore those. A true fish slick is going to be usually round or oval in shape. And it, it almost has like a little bit of a different shimmer to it as well uh, on the water when you're looking at them. But when you see one or smell one, and then see where it is, I start, the wheels start turning and I start asking myself questions. Okay, well, where is that slick happening? What is the water depth over there? What structure might be on the bottom? What's causing that? Because a lot of times you'll be like around crab traps or something like that. And sometimes I'll associate seeing a slick with a, with a, with a line of crab traps. If a crabber just came by and uh, changed all of his bait out, and emptied them and put them back in the water or whatnot. And so you got to ask yourself a few questions to start out with to why the slick is there and where it's located. And then as far as setting up on it, I like to look at where it is, take note in the current, which way the current, the water's moving, and then which way the wind is blowing because the fish are going to be upwind and or up current from where you see the actual slick. So you got to kind of think about it and assess the situation before you just go to fishing. Uh, a lot of people, they're going to want, I've seen a lot of people, they just want to go fish right where the slick is. And I'm always like, no, that you need to throw up here, up current, up wind from them. And another thing too about slicks that, uh, that I see a lot is I call them whiffs. A lot of times when you're on fish or in a fishy area, you'll see a slick pop up and I'm, it's literally there for about a minute and then it just goes right away. Some of them pop up and they 
you know, they'll pop up the size of uh, the bed of your truck. And then before you know it, they're 18 times that size, you know, and it's real spread out and big. So, you know, paying attention to those little things sometimes clues me in to where, to where a school of fish might be. And I'll adjust, uh, adjust my drift or, or where I'm anchored at to move over in front of them. You're talking about those slicks and that happens a lot out on, on these flats that you're talking about, whether it's shell beds and whatnot. Do you have an approach? Like how, how spooky are these fish out on these flats with regards to, you know, your hull slapping the water, your power pole going running. down. Yeah. Any, anything that you're using, trolling motor, all that kind of stuff. How much, you know, how wide do you need to give them a berth if you're trying to get say upwind or up current of a, of, of a slick or a fishy area? So I always say that you need to use the lightest means necessary to get to the fish. Okay. So I pretty much always use the wind to my advantage to kind of push the boat whenever I go fishing. So you see a slick and say, say you're lucky when you see it and you're a hundred yards away from it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to keep about a hundred, 150 yard distance from where I think the fish are. And I'll usually make a great big loop and get upwind, you know, upwind as far as I can and then kill the, kill the big engine, get on the trolling motor and then just kind of slowly drift right into where the fish are. And then, when you get a bite or uh, or if you want to stop and focus on an area a little bit, you know, either power pole down or slip your anchor in the water and uh, give it a little bit and then pick back up and move along that way. Fish are very, very, very spooky uh, in shallow water, and especially when you're talking about oyster shells because oyster, oyster shell, you know, if you've ever walked on an oyster shell bottom, it's as hard as concrete. You just have to imagine that every every sound, it's going to carry every like sound, and everything that's happening is reverberating through the water. So it's going to be a lot more uh, amplified. You, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. That's exactly the word I was looking for. Yeah, I got your back um, on. <laughs> well, what about them redfish, Richard? Do they produce a slick as well whenever they start feeding pretty hard? Yep, they sure do. Pretty much, it, pretty much all fish create some kind of slick. I think when they're uh when they're feeding you know and what's happening with that what's causing that slick is all fish when they eat they're not nibbling and chewing things up like we do when we eat our food they just inhale the entire bait directly down into their stomach and when they do that they inhale a bunch of water and so some water goes in their stomach and they have to regurgitate some of that water out of their stomach and that's what's causing the slick is some of that stomach acid and stuff coming out of their stomach you know, one thing that really tells me that that's exactly what's happening is that every once in a while, whenever I'm taking a speckled trout off of a off of a hook or whatnot, I can and I'm holding it there, and I'm the, the fish is kind of upwind of me. I get a whiff of that watermelon smell that uh, that we're talking about from from the fish. So that's why that's happening. That's really cool. That makes a lot of sense. It's cool, yeah, man. You know, I've heard uh, I, I've even heard guys at tuna fish. Uh, talk about getting out there around tuna and stuff like that, and they'll see slicks pop up, you know, and so that oh, you know sure. you can just tell that fish are in the area and the fish are feeding. That's all. That's all a slick is telling you that they're feeding fish in the area. I can't attest to uh, the the tuna slicks. They do have a smell, but I'm not sure that it's watermelon. Yeah, it might not be watermelon. That's just how the speckled trout usually uh, smells <laughs> to right. me. But uh, <laughs> but anywho, man, that's Honey pretty suckle. pretty pretty Honey neat. Suckle. It's honeysuckle. Tuna honeysuckle. Fish. Tuna, tuna <laughs> fish like smell like honeysuckle. <laughs> I can smell them. I can smell them from at least a mile away. That's neat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, now that's good stuff, man. I uh, I'm, I'm still learning this inshore game as well, and I enjoy fishing with you and fishing with Bobby. And last summer with Bobby, we fished a good bit of those slicks in the Mississippi Sound, and I learned a lot, a lot from him that day. It's something to definitely take note of, you know, you just never know where you're going to find a school of fish. And that's just a telltale sign uh, of where some fish are actually feeding. The bad news about slicks is they don't tell you what size fish they are. You know, a lot <laughs> right. of times you'll see all these slicks popping up all over the place and you pull in there and it's, you know, it's five zillion, 12 inch trout, you know. <laughs> hey, that's all right. That works too. I just yeah, still, can't, I still can't get the picture out of my mind of, of Richard Rutland aroused driving his boat to find this. Oh, man, you want to talk about fun, bro. I mean, <laughs> that's uh, that, that, uh, that gets me fired up. <laughs> that's gets right. Me real the, fired up. No matter how big they are, the tug is the drug. Whenever you find fish, you found fish. <laughs> that's it. A tug is a drug. I stole that one from you, man. That's I like right. that saying. For sure. <laughs> 
All right, That's Richard. Right. Well, Richard. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, we'll be checking back in with you, bud. If folks want to get in touch with you, I know you probably got a few trips left, but I imagine you're booking up pretty fast. How do they do it? Man, uh, coldbloodedfishing.com is my website. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, my uh, contact info is on all of those places. Drop me an email, text message. I'm 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 easy. I'm smoke easy. Sig- it's all but it's all, it's all. Yep, smoke signals. Yep, I picked those up too. He smells them. That's right. That's right. He smells <laughs> like <laughs> smells like watermelon. <laughs> That's it. All right, buddy. All right. Stay safe out there. All right, Captain. Hey, Richard. thank y'all for having me. Yes, sir. Keep whacking them. All right, Butch. Onshore, inshore. Everybody knows what's next. Offshore. Let's go talk to Angelo Di Paola in Orange Beach. Angelo. How was the Bahamas, man? I saw some of those photos on Facebook. Uh, looked like you had a little, played a little hooky this week. Man, just a, a quick trip down there. Did a little bit of fishing. We didn't score too much on the fishing. We raised a couple whites. Uh, the one day we decided to kind of tool around and do some lobstering and some sightseeing, the uh, the bite went off, and I don't think there was a boat that fished that didn't catch it. at least one billfish. But that's how it goes. It was a good time. and. Uh, you know, back at it here in Orange Beach and enjoying some nice spring weather. Well, we talked to Patrick Ivey last week, and it, it really sounded like things kicked off with regards to billfish offshore. I say we. I listened last week, but, but Butch talked to Patrick Ivey, and it sounds like things are heating up. What do you got for us this week out of Orange Beach Gulf Shores? Well, man, I know Patrick, you know, guys on the Born to Run, they obviously had, you know, we, but the show before that, we had talked about somebody's going to get out there and have a great, great billfish fishing trip. And obviously, we're falling right into a spring pattern right now. Big tuna weighed in at Destin this past weekend. Blue and uh, big bluefin. Talked to a buddy of mine that was riding in a helicopter between oil rigs off to the southwest and saw a massive school of bluefins in open water just blowing up. So... Obviously, those fish are those fish are coming in. We in the Gulf, we you know we have a quota of incidental catch that you can keep, and once we get to that tonnage, it's over. So last year we rarely do we ever go over that, but last year we went over it pretty early, and I think part of it is is boats are bigger, faster, and fishermen just have gotten better, and so there's just more likely to have an encounter that's going to end up in a fish being caught nowadays. So we got. Blue fans. Some buddies of mine went this past weekend to the shallow rigs off of Dolphin Island, caught some nice yellow fins on the chunk. The Wahoo fishing is really heating up here off to the southeast. You know, you're getting that 200 to 450 foot range, pull some high speed stuff or pull some shaky baits. Those guys are catching a handful of fish every day. And the swordfish bites finally starting to, to kick off here. A buddy of mine was out last week. Caught a couple of nice ones, lost a really big one. So it's uh, it's just kind of starting to happen. Well, that really big one term, you know, it's kind of relative. To me, a really big swordfish is 200 pounds or more, you know. I saw two. I saw another one you're talking about, uh, uh, Nick. I, I'm not even going to try and put it. I'm not even going to try, try and butcher his last name. But there was two that big caught this week. The other one wasn't quite as big as Nick's, but it was big. Yeah, so they're definitely a, starting to show up. That, that fish out of out of the keys, Stupid you know, big. almost eight hundred pounds. Stupid big! I can't even imagine that. I really can't. You know, that's a scary fish. Could you imagine really that is. next to your boat? That would actually, you know, that's a little bit would be a little intimidating for me. Can you imagine, you know, daytime when you've got all that light to be able to see, and you look down there and you see an eight hundred pound swordfish? I can't. I can't. <laughs> I cannot even imagine you know i'm like butch a big fish here in the gulf or swordfish a good one here in the gulf is, is a 200 pound fish you got 200 pound fish you had a good day you now we get some that push that 300 pound mark a couple every year but for whatever reason uh nobody's very rarely does somebody come in with something over 400 and 500 i'm sure there's when one or two caught i just couldn't put my finger on it right now uh, Angela, <laughs> so when i say good one, You've done a lot of daytime, and have you hooked and, and lost any really big fish that you felt like were, like, real, real big fish? You know, the second time I ever did it, we hooked a fish, and the only reason I say it was in the five 600-pound range is the trip before we caught a 591-pound mako, and 
both swordfish and makos have pretty similar body types and kind of density to the flesh. And this fish was every bit as big as that mako, and it would have been caught, except it was just me and one other guy in the boat. And we had the fish pretty much tuckered out. And when he bent down to pick up the harpoon, the fish shook its head and pulled the hook and just glided away. Oh when, he like, when he looked up, the rod tip was just straight. I go, oh. dude, I'm sorry. That fish is no longer with us. Oh, my so, God. I'd yeah, rather, I'd have rather have to bail off. <laughs> I'd rather one break me off or or chafe sure. through the leader, you know, just to see one just kind of shake that hook and just kind of ease off. I've seen that too many times. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, Angela, was, Joe was, and I were talking after we saw that big Nick swordfish, big Nick, big Captain Nick swordfish. <laughs> Dad and them fought, or Lady Ann fought one for like 15 hours one night. Joe, you probably know, you were out there. I was not out there on this one. I believe at like I, what I nine o'clock the and they I, fought it until like if i remember correctly we were on another boat out there but they hooked that fish i think it i think the story goes they hooked it at like two o'clock in the morning and fought it until five o'clock the next afternoon Ugh. Mm. and they, yeah they never saw it from the story that i've heard i don't I, know the, i think I've there's a couple people different out versions. there every once in a while they get hooked but like i mean so much so any big fish so many things can go wrong I mean, you could have everything right, and your line actually bumps up a kid's a piece of. Who knows? I mean, you get, you get too much sargasm. By, you know, you get too much sargasm on the line. I've lost fish that way. Anything can go wrong. And yeah. swordfish to me is a beast of the beasts. So, catch a fish that big is incredible. Yeah, it's good to hear they're catching them. Oh, yeah. What about uh, what about cobia, man? I mean, I know the cobia numbers have been down the last few years, and folks are kind of starting to get a little. A little allegedly about it but have any fish started to show up in orange beach yet you know a handful of fish there's not a lot i mean honestly guys like you know whenever we're talking i'm sitting out here walking the dock and there's like two boats here that have that have pulled their riggers down but just to kind of give you an idea yeah of kind of where people are at on that fishery i mean it's just hopefully it'll come back uh, it's one of those things, you know, I think we, we as humans kind of, you, you know, everything's 2020 hindsight. Hey, maybe we should have been keeping 15 of those fish every day back in the day. Good thing is, is, you know, this fish, my guess is they, they're putting some management stuff in place and with, with good management, they, they should recover pretty quickly. And Kobe you know, grow pretty fast, don't they? I think, I think, you know what they have a life cycle of about five to seven years. Yeah, they're about like they're almost like mahi, like dogs. That's what I thought too. I, I think, thought they, they grew, grew that fast. fast. And I, I think we do give ourselves a hard time for what we do as anglers. But you know, Butch, you, you and I have been able to spend a good bit of time with with a lot of scientists, and a lot of the data shows that we we don't have as big an impact on some fish as we think we do. Right. A lot of it is cyclical. A lot of it is water temperatures during the breeding period during the spawning period and influences that are beyond your control and you just you just assume that it's it's you so i don't know for me the jury's kind of still out on cobia because definitely that spring fishery where they're migrating down the beach anecdotally there's no doubt that no doubt there's less less numbers of fish for but sure. you, if you flip that to the early, uh, late summer, early fall fishery off of Mobile Bay, out on those rigs, or excuse me, out on the ships and, and the nearshore rigs, and I mean, there's plenty of fish, plenty of fish. Yeah, they go to Louisiana. They don't eat, you know, they don't struggle to catch a cobia over there. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm hesitant to just jump to conclusions too much. I just think it's changing. Down. And I've said it before, it's just changing. What if the fish that run that gauntlet up and down, you know, the east coast, or excuse me, the west coast of Florida, all the way up through Destin, where we where we typically fish like fish, what if they're just learning? What if they're like, screw that. <laughs> I'm not going back through there. Well, I can say this. Or you could have a change in the current, and they're going up the east coast. I mean, sure. there's all kinds of. Or just further offshore. Right. Why do they catch? Or you have a bad recruitment a year. Uh, why right. do they catch bigger swordfish off the keys than we do here in the northern Gulf? You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I can't answer those questions, yeah, but I've just that's, hesitated that's to a, jump to too many conclusions without some hard data. So yeah, that's a that's a dead horse, as we call it right now. 
anyway, well, that that's it stinks to hear that it's not it's not uh not improved much at least from from the sound of things on that side of things. But uh, it does sound like the offshore the blue waters is is getting right. Uh, yeah. What about what about bottom fish? Trigger fish still still pretty easy to come by, Angela. Man, it, every charter boat that comes here into Orange Beach Marina, they've got their limited trigger fish, usually some bee liners, some white snapper, king mackerel mixed in with it. I know Bill Staff came in with a bunch of tunas last week. Uh, you know, it's it's just kind of starting to happen. Uh, you know, and with that, you know, we're not that far away from tournament seasons. Yeah, when's right first, around the corner. When's that first tournament? The, the first one, I, have, I put out a tournament calendar magnet every year. If you want to get one, you can just go to my Facebook page, Angelo Di Paola Realtor, uh, the Coastal Connection, and uh, DM me, and I'll send one out. And the very first one, at least in our part of the world, is actually this week, weekend. It's called the Kids Win. It's a, probably a couple hundred kids out there. It's April 6th. But the first big boy, like, real fishing tournament, Pensacola, uh, Bug, Big Game Fishing Club has their Ladies' Day tournament May 10th through the 11th. Then we start off the Gulf Coast Triple Crown the following weekend to May 15th through 19th with the Orange Beach Billfish Classic. And we'll have boats, you know, in from Texas, Louisiana, Florida, nice. uh, out, all over the Gulf Coast coming over to fish that one. I think it was like a 50, 60 boat tournament last year. And we'll be full on fishing season by then. That's right, man. Uh, that's not that far. That's right around the corner. Yeah, it's not far at all. Well, well, what excites me the most about what you've talked about is the cobia. What about a cobia tip, man? You got any good, uh, good any, any good cobia tips on tap? Man, the, the, I learned this trick from a guy named Max Pace. So when you're cobia fishing over here, you usually have a bucket with an eel in it. And you have a rod with a jig. Maybe you got another rod with a pinfish. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with eels is a they're slimy and they kind of knot up get knotted up if, in your line so if you have a bunch of lines sitting in your bucket with your bait you're gonna you're gonna, you're have, gonna a have a issue gonna wrapped around the hook. you're gonna have a knot and then if you if you then if you have your line all taut the eel can't really move around and so that's not good for me either so it's like a little clip that you would use for like sailfish fishing you can go to j&m and talk to carson or or steven or andy any of those guys over j&m and it's about the size of your fingernail. Drill two little holes into the uh, up top near the top lip of your bucket and zip tie it into place. And you can just clip your line with just enough room for the eel to kind of swim around in your bucket, but not enough, not so much that he uh, he can tangle up your line. And when fishing's tough, you got to take advantage of your opportunities. The last thing you want to do is you see that perfect fish. He's you know he's going to be easy to cast to, and you pull your your top notch bait out and it's a tangled mess and I think we've know, all been there. As yeah. you Yeah. I mean if you fish enough you'll you'll oh, definitely been like, well that was a blown opportunity. That's a yeah, cool that's thing, one of those man. little things. I think my favorite part of this podcast are the all these little tips, the little things that really can make a difference because that has happened to me. That specific thing has happened to me where, you know, we had our I had my eel in the bucket, thought I had everything squared away good to go i'm up in the tower got my rod you know ready to roll see a fish go to pull the eel out of the bucket and it's literally the eel is literally tied in a knot lock knot yeah. line. and i'm yeah. going i'm fiddling around trying to get the jig and and i take my eyes off the fish and i turn around and gone. She gone. that something little like that can be the difference and, and some some days one cobia is is the difference that's the day that's the day yeah. <laughs> it is the day yeah. yeah so and you know like i say the and you know, that's a specific product made for fishing I, I don't see why you couldn't use something like a, a clothes pin you know sure to to just snap your line to the top of the bucket uh well, this it sounds just like makes what everything look is, nice and professional the key is is that that line can't slide in and out like an outrigger clip it needs to be able to pinch that line a little bit got to hold it in yeah that's right you could probably yep, you use just want to those, hold it in uh, place. You could probably use one of those heavy duty paper clips that they get, you know, like you where you bind a bunch of pieces yeah, of those, office paper together, printer paper together. Yeah. Something like that. Any of that stuff will work. But you want you want to keep that line in place. You want the bait to be able to swim around. So you know, have some wiggle, a little bit of ice in your bucket. 
uh, will kind of keep them calm. And then what's kind of nice is when they're cooled in the bucket and you throw them in the Gulf of Mexico and that water's a little warmer, they get it. They really get to wiggling pretty good, and uh, that always helps. All right, Angelo. Well, good luck out there, man. Uh, we'll check back in hey. with you soon, and thanks for that report. Hey, you guys have a good one, and we'll catch up later. See ya. All right, Butch. It was good to be back this week. I, I really miss being here for a couple of weeks. I, I like talking to all these guys, and we're coming up on our one-year anniversary of the podcast, and I, I genuinely feel like I learned something every single week. Oh, we no doubt. That. It's a lot of fun. And speaking of fun – uh, this week's What Did You Learn is sponsored by the 6th Annual Florabama Fishing Rodeo. It's the funnest fishing tournament on the Gulf Coast. This year, it's going to be May 31st through June 2nd. We already got our... I about to say, we're going to be there. Yeah, we already got our condo booked. I'm excited about that. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. It could uh, be dangerous. No, no, no photo that week. Yeah, uh, they just got a cool venue over there. Uh, they got a lot of cool venues a- along the coast. In fact, over in Santa Rosa Beach, they got another place called Shunk Gully. You and I have hung out there. Yeah, uh, I just, I just think they do a real good job with their, with their venues. But anyway, uh, guys, go check this this out. It's uh, there's over thirty categories of fish. There's everything from blue crabs to speckled trout to red snapper, all the way up to the, the big stuff, swordfish, and and lots more. It's a it's a really great way to get kids involved. Uh, it's a low entry fee, uh, really cool prizes. Weigh-ins are there at the Floribama Old River Grill. So guys, just get, I don't know, get out there, join the party, visit their sponsor area. They got some really good live music lined up, good food, a lot of fun, a lot of really good family environment. I'm bringing my little boy and we're going to hang out there for the weekend. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, more info and tickets over at FloribamaFishingRodeo.com. Butch, what do you think, man? What'd you learn? I think that what I tied in this week was David Thornton was talking about nobble sickles and you know you can lose a couple of nice fish early in the morning if you're not ready and your bait's not thought out properly. Angelo was talking about you know making sure every cast that you make with that eel you know I like his clip tip. I think that Luke in Virginia will like that tip as well. We usually fish two or three eels up there because you might get five or six fish and you got to present some serious baits up there so i think he'll like that i thought of him when angelo was talking about that you got to capitalize when you can i think it's all in the details i mean the small little things can make a difference in a great day and a pretty poor day i mean you miss two or three fish that's your day especially when you talk about cobia king mackerel some big ticket items you know yeah especially when you're fishing for a fish where where one fish can make the day that's right i was telling you that that exact thing had happened to me with the eel that's happened to me and the biggest cubby I've ever seen in my life. Same kind of deal. Saw the fish, kept my eyes on the fish, reached over, grabbed the rod and reel to throw a jig to it. And as I pulled that reel across the tower, the, the main line hooked on the steering wheel knob. Mm. And when I went to cast it, it was just, it was total Bush league maneuver. That does not surprise me with you. You're pretty well, bushly anyway. I mean, I just want people to, you know, learn, learn from your mistakes. My mistakes, and there's plenty to learn from. That's but, right. you know, just something little like that where, hey, man, if I had just not had that rod across the tower from me, even though I'm right-handed, if I just kept it on. Anyway, some things are just going to happen. You can't prevent it all. But the, you but, tell you how but, I, but how the I prevent was, stuff like that? You just don't see cobia? Well, not around here very much, but... <laughs> Just if you want to, you know, specifically target cobia or trout or blue marlin or whatever your bucket list item is, not necessarily bucket list, whatever you want to get good at, man, go, go take Richard, you know, go get a, go get on him on a charter or Bobby, learn the details from those guys that do it every single day. And they know my dad always says, I may not know how to catch them all, but I've lost them every way possible. Right. There's no doubt. I know know how to uh, not lose them. That's what makes this show so valuable is that you're literally getting to tune in to these yeah. guys having tens of thousands of hours on the water targeting these specific species and yep. they're sharing that knowledge and, and that learning curve so much quicker, but there's still nothing that compares, like you said, yep. to getting out on the water with them and just picking it up and absorbing it from them right there. Yeah. Absolutely. Save All you a right. lot of time. Well, that's going to wrap it up, folks. As always, thanks for listening. Subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. We, man, we surely appreciate all the downloads. 
March was our 12th month and our highest downloaded month to date. Big thanks to you guys for making this show a continued success and big thanks to our sponsors uh, for making it possible and, and keeping it free for all you guys. If you, if you can reach out to those sponsors of the show and, and uh, let them know you listen and, and patronize their businesses. They're the ones that uh, make this thing happen. So big thanks to you guys. Y'all uh, keep whacking. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. Also brought to you by GEICO. Call Ron Davis, GEICO agent at 251-445-0053 or visit him online at geico.com slash mobile dash AL. This is Captain Richard Rutland, and this report is brought to you by Cold-Blooded Fishing. You can find us at www.coldbloodedfishing.com. And also, Great Days Outdoors, the South's finest hunting and fishing magazine. Pick up your copy wherever magazines are sold or check them out at greatdaysoutdoors.com.